Okay, colleagues, good evening. Hello and welcome back. Um, hopefully we're live. And <laughs> uh, uh, welcome back to another lecture in our uh, course, Philosophy of the Natural and the Social Sciences. Uh, I, almost, I almost feel a little bit like a radio host. Uh, <laughs> welcoming you to our, so to speak, uh, Saturday Night Live program, almost. Um, okay. So, um, I'm at the same time, I'm trying to double check if the stream is working. Okay, it should be, it should be, but I'm not. Oh yeah, okay, okay. It seem, seems, seems that it's working, it seems like it's working. So, um, basically, what I wanted to do today, what I wanted to do today is to um, uh, use this opportunity to um, Take, you know, step back a little bit from the course and just reflect on some of the um, major topics. So this lecture is going to be uh, a bit of an improvisation. Um, I want to talk about some of the things, some of the topics, the, the ideas and the concepts that in many ways I consider to be the most important in the whole course. And these are the ideas that even though they animate the course as a whole, usually um, we don't really have time to address them head on. So basically, again, I am, I am talking about this uh, um, question of uh, science and morality, the question of values, which I consider to be the most important part of, you know, most important question of the whole course, guiding question of the whole course. Um, as you remember, we have began the very first lecture. Um, I have said that um, sort of as my inspiration, <laughs> for the whole course, I take uh, um, Kant's very famous formulation that there are three basic questions. What should I do? What can I know? What can I hope for? And all three questions can be reduced to the fourth most fundamental question, what is a human being? And I talked about this practical approach. So in many ways, I would like to try and to bring um, these ideas together today, at least uh, 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 um, to some extent. So... Um, let me start somewhere, and then we'll see how it goes. So as, as you remember, we have this uh, idea of, like, of practical approach to philosophy. So philosophy is a practical enterprise, as a practical discipline. Um, and especially this, this idea that um, goes back to the ancient Greeks. So the ancient Greeks uh, uh, had this notion that philosophy should be to the soul what medicine is to the body. So philosophy to the soul, what medicine is to the body. Which is to say that philosophy, oh, like philosophy should be therapeutic. So philosophy as therapy. Okay, philosophy as therapy. And um, we can see this uh, basic approach, I think, in all of the major thinkers of the Western philosophical tradition, um, starting with, uh, um, with uh, uh, Socrates and um, Descartes. Well, <laughs> sorry, starting, starting with Socrates in the ancient Greece. And Socrates very famously says that virtue uh, um, is the same thing as, as knowledge that in, in an important sense, human virtue or human excellence. So when we say virtue, we mean, so the Greek word is arete. Uh, so the, the proper excellence of a human being, the proper, you know, um, proper human excellence is derived from knowledge, right? So in general, this idea that the task of philosophy and the task of science in general is to inform human life and to inform human values, right? So, um, uh, yeah, very often you will find these images, like, for example, the ancient Stoics talked about how if you imagine all of, you know, like the, the body of human knowledge as an egg, they would say that physics and logic are the shell and the yolk, but, but uh, sorry, sorry, but the, uh, physics and logic are the shell and the white, but the yoke, the centerpiece, the most important stuff is ethics. Ethics mm -hmm. is the highest 
uh, discipline. Likewise, uh, Rene Descartes very famously said that, again, if you imagine the tree of knowledge as a tree with roots and trunk and branches, then ethics would be the fruit, right? So ethics, uh, uh, for, for many philosophers, um, for, I would say for most of the major philosophers in the Western tradition, um, saw ethics as the uh, um, highest enterprise, highest enterprise. Um, so basically, again, ethics as the fruit uh, on the tree of knowledge. And um, basically, mm, when I was your age, when I was starting to do philosophy seriously for the very first time, um, this was very much the question that animated my thinking. Um, I thought, um, mm, and I agree with my basic assessment back from the day, I thought that, like, what should I do? What should I do is, like, the most important guiding question of all philosophical uh, enterprise. What should I do? And in many ways, uh, uh, I thought that sort of unless, sort of, if, if, if you are doing something, if you are engaged in a particular pursuit and it does not inform this question, then seemingly you are wasting your time. And over the years, I was, you know, interested and I've, I've spent a lot of time on issues of uh, cosmology, astrophysics, Big Bang, you know, questions of biology, philosophy of biology, Darwinian natural selection, or, you know, questions of history, questions of history of religion, you know, uh, uh, of history of, you know, Abrahamic religions such as Christianity, Islam, Judaism, history of religions outside the West, religious and philosophical traditions outside the West, such as uh, uh, Taoism or Confucianism or uh, Hinduism. And I, I've, I've always, I always thought that um, pursuing these questions, pursuing these fields is deeply important because it, it, helped, it helped me personally to answer this, I think, most important question. You know, again, the, the question of ethics. What, what should I do? Or alternatively, what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning? Or if you want, what is the value of life? Um, and... Um, Again, if, if I try to go back mentally to the first year, again, uh, um, I started, I, I began, you know, I, I became seriously interested in philosophy around, around the first year of, uh, you know, <laughs> bachelor's program, uh, slightly more years ago than I care to admit. And in my first year, the philosophers who inspired, who in, um, inspired and impressed me most were the skeptical philosophers. Um, and so, again, so the, the skeptical philosophers, um, such as um, Descartes, but also, very importantly, David Hume, and I think also in many ways Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Um, because in this sort of, this is a skeptical tradition, but also this kind of skepticism, I think, very naturally leads one so, uh, to, 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 to a certain kind of critical philosophy. So skepticism, critical philosophy. And so, especially in my second year, so again, so we begin with Descartes and Hume, but also then you can talk about Rousseau and Marx. So let's say, let's say Descartes and Hume, and then Rousseau and Marx. And um, so maybe, maybe let me make this into a new slide, and let me, let me try to talk about this. So this would be skepticism, skepticism, and uh, critical theory. And uh, 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 in general, in general, I suppose my main connection is going to be, as usual, conflict and consensus. And I'm going to try. Uh, uh, I talked about this. I talk about this almost every class. But maybe, maybe, maybe this time, uh, 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 you know, it'll become clearer why I am. I don't want to say I'm obsessed, but why do I find these categories so important and so instructive at the end of the day? Again, this is an idea that we keep walking around in many ways, right? But still, I think it's important. So it, 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 it's the kind of thought that <laughs> bears repetition. It's like it's, it won't do any harm for us to think about this again. So, um, again, sort of, where does philosophy begin? So I've talked about this many times before. So in this Heideggerian fashion, I always already find myself thrown into this world and thrown into this world also very importantly without a manual. But, uh, which is to say that we find ourselves with always already within a certain situation, with certain predispositions. Um, but of course, um, if we try to think back, 
biographically, our existence begins with the fact of our, well, <laughs> not the fact, but the presumed fact of our birth, which none of us remembers, um, and early childhood. And so since, since, the, since, the very, since the very beginning right, of our lives, we are dependent. We are dependent on other people. And um, we are dependent in many ways. So again, this, this idea that uh, um, there's a certain important vulnerability of childhood. So childhood vulnerability, um, vulnerability and helplessness. We need others in order to survive. So we need, we need the help of others. And we also, it's not just that, it's not that we're dependent on others for our survival, but also in many important ways, we get the language itself and also the concepts from people around us. So uh, the, the structure of our psyche, the structure of our psychological life in an important sense is deeply dependent on our upbringing, on, on our early childhood experience. Um, and um, this, is, this is actually a very important uh, uh, issue in, in, in philosophy in general. This idea that um, actually at the end of the day, so for people like um, Aristotle or people like David Hume or I think also people like Heidegger, they would say that habit is really the thing that guides us. So habit is much more important than choice. Habit or character. Habit or character. That, again, as, uh, uh, um, as children of a particular family, but also as the children of a particular culture. So, again, we are dependent on our family, but also we are dependent on the culture in which we live in. And so, in, in many ways, we are uniquely the products of both our family and our culture. Uh, um, so, let me write survival. Survival, but also thinking. Uh, thinking, broadly speaking, psychological life. And um, again, this idea that again, habit and character are much more important than choice. And that in many ways, society uh, tells us mm, what is right and teaches us to, under, to, un, to know right from wrong. So there's a certain, it seems, an important element of social consensus. So society teaches us uh, uh, what is right what is right and how to tell right from wrong. But also society tells us what is good. What is good. So what is what is good or what is morally right, right? Morally right. And society in many ways, it seems, tells us what to desire. And this is an, uh, uh, an important uh, uh, concept I keep um, circling around. Again, this idea for the lack of a better uh, um, uh, expression, so again, so this would be, I don't know, social construction, social construction of the self. This idea that mm, 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 the, the dominant values, uh, um, I don't want to say they are entirely socially constructed. Of course, you can find examples throughout history, examples of free, free thinkers, such as Socrates, for example, who tries to step outside of his education, although to what extent does he actually step outside it? It's not clear, right? So he still uses a lot of uh, 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 the resources, traditional and sexual resources of ancient Greek culture. And in some ways, Socrates is a rebel, but in other ways, he's actually very much a conformist. Again, you know, drawing back to the ideals of the ancient Homeric past. Mm. So dominant values are, to a large extent, to a large, large extent, mm, a product of our environment. And again, this, this, this idea, especially if we go back to somebody like Plato, this idea, like for example, for example, you can, you can think of the cultures that are dominated uh, by the pursuit of truth, so this could be uh, 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 um, technocracies, I guess, but it's harder for me to imagine this kind of an example. So maybe uh, um, like with a question mark, so secular, secular truth, T. 
technocracies. But let me, let me put this in brackets because I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I can find good historical examples of such <laughs> uh, uh, communities. Although, you know, as, as sub-communities, like, you know, people within, within the academy, maybe makes more sense. Uh, but certainly, if we talk about religious truth, so the communities that value, that, that, that are animated by the values of sanctity, where uh, um, the most uh, um, pre prestigious roles in society are those of priests, then, um, so, for, so this, this is, by and large, comes from Plato. Right? But you also can find communities which are based on um, military glory or prowess, right? And uh, um, the highest virtue here would be, let's say, courage, or let's say honor, honor and courage. And th these would be the societies of warriors. And again, I, I mean this in a, very, in a very straightforward sense. Again, like when you are a child, your, your, the, your society, your parents, your peers, your teachers, everybody, you know, there, there's a certain discourse, there's a certain narrative, there's a certain story, right, that is told about us. And in this story, who, who is like the best person? Who is the most excellent individual? Is it the priest or, or, or a monk? A priest, or, or, or maybe, or maybe an ascetic monk. So let me, uh, a priest or an ascetic, ascetic monk. Who is the hero? Who is the childhood hero? Who do you want to become when you grow up? Or is it a warrior? Is it a warrior or a soldier? Right. And of course, um, if we look in, at societies today, uh, and well, it depends. It's it's a complicated question. Again, if we talk about societies of warriors, if you think of uh, uh, Prussia, Prussia of the 19th century. You know, the kind of society that Hegel, for example, describes. I think it's, you know, I think it's quite clear that the, the most honored people in society are probably, probably the officers, probably military officers, like the, 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 the pinnacle of achievement. Like, uh, or, or even if not military officers, uh, types of statesmen, right? So like um, highest honor, highest glory, highest achievement in life comes from the service to the state. So let me let me maybe even add this to uh, uh, to the list. So again, like Prussia of the 19th century, service to the state, and this could be civil service or military service. Um, and you know, Soviet Union maybe also to some extent. Although again, this is you see, this is a class in philosophy. This is not a class in. Uh, <laughs> sociology. Uh, I'm not an expert on this. You know, it, it seems plausible that the Soviet Union also falls into this category, but who knows? But then, um, and you see again, um, um, very often I think philosophy thrives in periods of crisis. And um, I don't want to go too much into my biography, but as, as some of you might know, I actually I was born in and, and raised in Russia in the 90s, and I feel I think that there was a certain feeling in the air. There was a certain loss of uh, uh, orientation, you know, something something that Durkheim would call anomie, right? So, uh, 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 so um, anomie. This idea, this idea that we don't know what the values are, or or there is no consensus. There is no consensus what the values are, and it's like people. This, is, this, this can be deeply depressing. In fact, Durkheim notes how this could lead uh, uh, to people actually committing suicide. This idea that you do not know what, what, what actually you should do with your life, right? And uh, um, again, so I, I talked about how children are born helpless and parents, you know, uh, parents and our, you know, childhood environment teaches us, well, first of all, helps us to survive, but also teaches us how to think, how to think logically, but also how to think in terms of values inculcates certain values in us, right? Mm. And if society does not do this, like, you see, um, this is problematic, this is paternalistic, right? We are dependent on our parents to tell us what is right. And this gives our parents a lot of power. This gives our parents, and in general, it gives society a lot of power vis-a-vis -vis us as children, right? To, to steer us in this direction or in that direction. So this is, you know, somebody, somebody like Foucault, somebody like Foucault would say that this is a, a dangerous, dangerous power, uh, um, that this, um, how, should I, how should I phrase this, um, that this could lead to, uh, well, basically like indoctrination. So, so somebody, whoops, somebody like Foucault could ask this question. 
what is, isn't this indoctrination? How do, you, how, do you t how do you tell upbringing from indoctrination? Upbringing versus indoctrination. And how can you know, right? Because if your society teaches you how to think, how do you know that society uh, or, or your parents teach you something that is in your interests and not, let's say, just take advantage of you? This is why, again, I, I keep talking about this conflict consensus. Uh, 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 basically, again, is upbringing uh, functional? Is it good? Is it, is it in your interest? Or is it indoctrination? Mm. So it's like, let's say, upbringing or indoctrination, right? So conflict or consensus, upbringing or indoctrination. And again, we as grown-ups, we when you know, if, if if we think about this critically and we realize to what extent we're actually determined by society, this could become potentially a very troubling question because it's it's hard to think this through. Because when you are trying to think this question through, you are using the resources which are given to you by your society, and it's like. Uh, 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 successful indoctrination, the, 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 the sort of the best way to um, control somebody is to make them believe that they are free. So illusion of freedom is the uh, um, sort of illusion of freedom is the, um, is the most efficient way of control, right? Is the most efficient um, way of control, point of control, mechanism mechanism of control. And it's like when you, when you are thinking about your life and you are saying, I am a good person and, 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 and my, life, my life is good, my life is good. So I, I can tell you a story. I can explain, I can argue, I can explain why my life is good, right? And you see, like if, if, you, if we think about this philosophically, right? There's always a problem. Um, do you have a good argument or do you have a bad symptom? Uh -huh. Do you have a good argument and your life is really good or do you have a bad symptom and your life is really horrible but your society indoctrinates you? So good argument and your life is, life is good. Or a bad symptom and you have, we have, you have been successfully indoctrinated. It's like, and you know, similar things, sort of, I can explain why my life is good, or I can tell you why, uh, why my society is just. I can prove that society is just. We've had similar conversations with some of you uh, to, to this effect, right? Uh, um, sort of, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of this uh, uh, social justice talk going on right now. And uh, some people are going to say, no, actually, our society is already meritocratic, is already meritocratic. And people who occupy positions of power are, are already the people who should occupy positions of power. And the question is, 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 this, is this line of argument, is it true, is it a good argument, or is it a bad symptom? And we have simply been successfully indoctrinated to, uh, to accept these uh, arguments, which are really subpar, right? And um, mm, 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 mm. Let, me, let me continue. So... Uh, uh, Likewise, uh, um, I can prove that society is just, or I can prove that God exists. Let me, let, let's be politically correct. So God exists, right? Or I can, I can prove that I am free. Or uh, I can prove that my life has meaning. And like with all of these statements, the, the, the question is, do you have a good argument or do you have a bad symptom? In general, in philosophy, let's, let's introduce some philosophical jargon. In general, in philosophy, this is some, often referred to as hermeneutics, hermeneutics of suspicion. And this phrase um, is usually associated with uh, Nietzsche, Freud, and Marx. Nietzsche, Freud and Marx, who actually, like, for all three of these, th there would be this idea of, again, a, of a bad symptom. So Nietzsche would talk about 
a form of ideology. Freud would talk about maybe the, um, the unconscious or the superego speaking. It is the superego. It's, it's not you who are, who are speaking. It is the superego speaking through you. Mm -hmm. Let me let me actually actually. I think that's an important thought. Let me add it to the board. Mm -hmm. So, is it you who is speaking? Or is it the dominant ideology? Well, okay, let, me, let me just write ideology. Is it the ideology that's, that speaks through you? The ideology or the superego or whatever speaking through you? So to speak through your mouth, through you. And, and, and you are just a vessel. You are just a vessel, right? Um, yeah, let me, let, me, let me finish with this uh, 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 um, idea I was talking about. So again, so we said dominant values are large extent products of our environment. So again, so you have this religious truth, society of priests or ascetic monks, monks military glory, honor, courage, society of warriors. Or again, as a person who lived through the 90s, I saw in front of my eyes, I saw this anomic picture where people did not know what to believe People did not know what to consider true, beautiful, good, just. People did not know what to consider successful human life. People did not understand what does it mean to be a decent human being, or a success, an excellent human being, right? And um, the, 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 the answer that, um, um, I don't know, that was seen as dominant in the 90s, although, again, 90s, I think, was a period of <laughs> chaos more than anything else, but this is, cert this is certainly the, the answer that tried to assert, assert itself. And this would be the society of uh, uh, merchants, right? So religious truth, military glory, and this would be uh, mercantile success. So not honor and courage, but wealth, right? And this would be the society not of priests, not of warriors, but this would be the society, the society of uh, 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 merchants, uh, basically. Merchants or money makers, how will you want to call them? And uh, uh, this is this is more or less the way uh, Plato presents this. Although you can find this idea in many other places, um, you can also. So we talk about Plato, but you can also think of this in terms of the uh, uh, Indian caste system, right? So you have the uh, um, the Brahmins, who are the um, the priests. You have the Kshatriya, who are the warriors, and you have the Vaishi, who are the merchants, right? So it seems that this, this partition has something beneath it. Now, I'm, I, am, I am giving you these uh, three examples. Uh, could there be more? Uh, maybe, maybe, okay? So, you know, take this, uh, take this as just mm, 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 stimulation for thought, basically. Like, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe you can find different other better examples. And about these secular truths and technocracies, I'm not I'm not sure again if it's if it's such an such an excellent example. But anyway, I think definitely something to think about. Okay, 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 okay. So, um, and I think like in in many in many ways in many ways, um, as people who are starting to do philosophy, we have to go through this uh, um, skeptical phase when we face this question of conflict and consensus. And so, especially, uh, uh, um, I was talking about um, skepticism and critical philosophy or critical theory, mm, social critique. Let's put it this way. Right? And again, so Descartes, Descartes and Hume, Descartes and Hume will call our knowledge into question. So this would be knowledge in question. Basically, how do you know that you are not in the matrix? How do you know that you are not in the matrix? Right? And uh, um, the Rousseau and Marx have a different kind of argument. So today, today I usually begin with Thrasymachus, Thrasymachus and Callicles. Explaining, explaining this point, right? And here's the idea of uh, uh, values in question. 
and again, I talk about Rousseau and Marx because uh, chronologically speaking, uh, biographically speaking, these were the philosophers that helped me realize this. Um, basically, like the first one is how do you know that you're not in the matrix? And the second one is I think much more practical, much more practical question. How do you know that again, I already, I already said, how do you know that ideology, that ideology is not speaking through you? Do you, have a, do you have a good argument or a bad symptom, right? How do you know that you're not indoctrinated? Right? Or how do you know that you are not um, like indoctrinated by some kind of ruling group, ruling power? Again, this, this, uh, this idea in Rousseau and Marx that society uh, uh, corrupts us. Society takes advantage of us. So society, like, deeply does not have our interests at heart. And in fact, in fact, uh, like, the proper task of philosophy then would be to help a person unlearn all the unhelpful things that society has taught them, right? As Epicurus says, uh, uh, we must free ourselves from the prison of public education and politics. Okay, and this, is, this is a quote from Epicurus. I think this is from the Vatican sayings with a question mark. Well, anyway, it's not important. You, you can always look this up. Um, so, okay, 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 okay. This is, this is so, so I think, I think it's like we need to, mm, mm, what, I'm, what I'm driving at is that I think that there's a fundamental experience for doing philosophy. So this point of groundlessness, groundlessness. So basically, uh, uh, um, groundlessness basically due to uh, Descartes and Marx's suspicion, right? And I think if you want to really do philosophy, at one point in your intellectual career, there needs to come a point where you feel the loss of ground beneath your feet. So the point in time where of, of, of uh, complete loss of ground. And, and after this, after this, so the next thing you do, it seems to me, again, I'm, I'm sort of, in, <clears throat> in many ways I'm just thinking out loud and I'm inviting you to join me <laughs> in this. Uh, 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 conversation, thinking out loud. Um, just to be on the safe side, um, I'm not necessarily saying that, uh, you know, that I believe that this is true or everybody has to go through the same steps. But like, even if you don't agree with me, I hope that you do find these questions stimulating. <laughs> anyway, so a point of complete loss of ground. And so the next thing that happens is you, you, you try to find, so an attempt, an attempt to find, uh, a point of contact, a point of ground, some, uh, uh, find an Archimedean point, Archimedean point within oneself. Because, why? Why within oneself? Because honestly, you cannot trust, uh, uh, because, you know, you cannot trust the outside. Because of Descartes and Marx. De Descartes and Marx show us why you cannot trust things outside. And I keep talking about Descartes and Marx. I might as well talk about David Hume and Marx. Should, should, I, should I change Descartes to Hume, I wonder? Yeah, let's write David Hume, okay. Uh, in this sense, Hume does not make the, <laughs> the atrociously bad move of assuming God in order to prove the reliability of reason. So I guess in this philosophical competition, I should declare Hume to be the winner. Um, so attempt to find an Archimedean point within oneself. But the problem is that you, it's, like, it's impossible. Like you, you never find this point. So, but the point is not there. But the point is not there. Uh, um, there, there is no firm ground. There's just quicksand just quicksand. And so I think in a, in a, in a, in a um, sort of point reminiscent of Karl Popper, so similarly to Popper, what we are, what, 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 what we are basically doing is we are driving 
uh, the files into the quicksand. And this, 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 is, this is a continual process. It's a continual process. A perpetual search. And again, uh, um, so, similar, so similar to, so okay, let's, let's write CF proper. And now compared to Socrates, right? So very much, I think this is the way Socrates saw the philosophical enterprise. I know that I know nothing, you know? He is wise among mortals who understands that our knowledge is not worth much. We have talked about this a lot in the beginning of the course, you know, these skeptical arguments. He is wise who, like Socrates, understands that he knows that he knows nothing, right? Uh, uh, and so what is left for us to do? What is left for us to do is to try our best um, together to think through this issue, to try to come to some conclusions. And the conclusions are never final. Uh -huh. this, is, this is a perpetually open-ended process, continual process, perpetual, perpetual search, and uh, uh, it's always open-ended enterprise, open-ended, in a sense that it's, it's, it's never final. Um, now, good question, good question. Why do we do this together? And um, the, the answer is, uh, the answer seems to be yes, because it's uh, hard to talk uh, just inside your head. Because, you know, because man is by nature a political animal. Man is by nature a political animal. We, ca we, we, we can't survive alone, we cannot really think alone. So can't survive, can't think alone. Um, and is this true? I don't know, but okay. So let, again, let me let me let me let me let me put a question mark here. But it seems it seems to me it seems to me this has to be an enterprise in which we engage together, um, for the very simple reason that again, it's like um, human beings are not autonomous. Like if we were gods, yeah, then we could do philosophy by ourselves in our own head. But in reality, we are very much dependent on other people. And uh, we are dependent on teachers, on friends, on family. And um, um, again, so I'm talking about David Hume and uh, Karl Marx, but especially if we talk in, in the Marxist, uh, uh, in the Marxist fe, uh, vein, right? So people like, again, Rousseau or Marx, this idea of social criticism. Um, so, uh, uh, so for people like, again, Rousseau and Marx, uh, if, society really indoctrinates us. If the social order is wrong and we live in the situation of conflict, right, and we, we do really have a bad uh, symptom and not a good argument, then, how should I put this? Social exploitation or social conflict, social conflict is a systemic problem and it has to be solved by systemic means. It has to be solved by systemic means. And this is in many ways, I think, the, I, I, I talked last time about the project of enlightenment, so here we come back to the project of enlightenment. This idea that um, as a society, we can understand that we have this systemic issue. So understand that we have a problem and solve it together. So, uh, um, so understand that there's a problem, explain that there's a problem, convince people that there's a problem, and solve the problem together. Together. I'm not sure if it makes complete sense, but again, if there are questions, by all means, or, or if you have different suggestions, by all means, let's uh, uh, discuss this more in the seminar. Um, but let me let me let me go back to this idea of the Archimedean point. Let me go back to this idea of the Archimedean point. And um, I think if we if we try to think through this notion of the Archimedean point, um, maybe the most interesting and the most fruitful place to start is actually uh, uh, Hume's guillotine, right? Which which I have uh, um, actually uh, um, singled out, right? Highlighted as the one of the possible titles of today's lecture is ought problem. The problem of you know the relationship between the is and the ought. Um, and this is this is the question: how do we know? How do we know 
what, what, what the values are. How do we know what is good with a capital G? And um, the, I think, I think, and again, this is a point, so it's a deeply disconcerting and problematic point, this point of loss of philosophical innocence, loss of philosophical innocence, right? When we are young, we have this illusion or understand, you know, sort of illusion or false impression that actually it's not hard to know what is the right thing to do. It is not hard to know that uh, uh, sort of what, what, is, what is good and what is bad. It's not, it's not hard to know. Like it is obvious. It's obvious what is right and what is wrong. And this is, again, uh, <laughs> as we become older and more sophisticated, we understand that this is, this is, this is, this is an illusion uh, um, in many ways. So um, partly because we ourselves run into, into um, moral dilemmas that we cannot solve. But more importantly, more importantly, because as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, we see that people do not agree. As a matter of fact, people do disagree. And again, disagree often violently. Uh, uh, so often violently. So this clash of uh, values leading to wars and genocides. Um, where like both sides, both sides of the conflict be believe that the truth is on their side. So both sides believe that truth, capital T truth, is on their side. Right? And once we, once we understand that there is no simple solution to the problem of goodness, right? And again, again, it's like, uh, uh, this is this is I think a very important idea for us to understand philosophically speaking. Right? So we take courses such as course in the history of religion or courses you know in history of Western philosophy, and we realize that people disagree. That, let's say, Jesus uh, 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 and Aristotle uh, and I don't know uh, Diogenes. Let me let me find an appropriate symbol. Yes, this is an appropriate symbol. So Aristotle disagrees with Jesus, disagrees with Diogenes, disagrees with uh, Buddha, disagrees with uh, I don't know. And the list goes on. I don't know Plato, or somebody, right? So people have different values. So uh, different and mutually exclusive values. Different, mutually exclusive values of, of various philosophies and religion and religions of various philosophies and religions and again in many in many ways this is the insight that is that appears very clearly in the works of ancient sophists they have they have they have realized this they have realized that and and, and that you know cultures are different as ancient Greeks, they traveled around the Mediterranean and they actually saw how different people worship different gods and different peoples have different values, right? And so they, they came to this conclusion you know, that, that, that maybe there's, again, this distinction between phusis and nomos, right? That uh, 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 um, nature is not convention and convention is not nature. Convention maybe is against nature, that human, human conventions are maybe against nature. Again, this conflict versus consensus, if you want, right? And um, the... Immediately, immediately, the suspicion and the worry that the ancient sophists had, people like Thrasymachus or like Callicles, the, the, the worry that they had, and we have already talked about this before, so Callicles and Thrasymachus, similarly to, uh, uh, um, similarly to um, uh, Rousseau and Marx, are gonna say, would say that, again, uh, uh, upbringing is indoctrination, upbringing is indoctrination. And in fact, what society tells us is good, uh -huh. society tells us that something is good, but actually it's not good. It is, in, as Thrasymachus says, 
uh, justice is the interest of the stronger. The ruling party declares something to be good, but actually it is merely their interest. So uh, the universal goodness, the universal goodness is simply a mask for sectional interest. So universal goodness or justice is simply a mask for sectional interest. It's an important, important problem. Um, let me actually, just for the sake of being pedantic, so when we talk about hermeneutics of suspicion, you can talk about Nietzsche, Freud, and Marx, but also I think you can talk about Darwin. And I, I tried to give the, uh, the uh, uh, um, disconcerting, suspicious formulations of the Darwinian picture in, 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 the, in our course, right? Because, uh, well, <laughs> many ways in which evolution misleads us, right? Leads us to make mistakes that sort of, again, Evolutionarily speaking, mind, the mind is not a machine for arriving at the truth, but mind is a machine for jumping to conclusions. So Darwin, uh, 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 mind, the mind, the mind is not evolved to see the truth, uh, um, but the mind is a machine for jumping to conclusions. Um, in the service, in the service of uh, um, you know perpetuation of the lineage of genes and means, in the service of genes and means. And again, I have this phrase that I keep talking about how. Um, Humans are anxious and most unconscious products of larger forces of biological and cultural evolution, manufactured by these forces, not to be free, but to fulfill a certain function in the perpetuation of the logic of these systems of biological cultural evolution. <laughs> manufactured not to be happy, but to fulfill, again, a certain function. Evolution. So mind as manufactured uh, by biological and cultural evolution for, you know, for, for, for uh, these other goals and means. And I think, again, uh, there's, there's a lot to be drawn. There's, lo there's a lot of interesting conclusions that we can draw by comparing Nietzsche to Freud to Marx and to Darwin at the same time, reading the, the four together. Mm, masters of suspicion. Suspicion uh -huh, that you don't, maybe you don't have a good argument, but you have a bad symptom. Um, and so, again, so, so we, we, I want to get to David Hume today, right? So we start with this notion, how do we know what is good? So as a matter of fact, in fact people do disagree, often violently. Huh? So we have this clash of values that leads to war and genocide. Uh, um, and um, yeah, so basically, again, if I'm, I'm driving all of this towards a certain potentially positive conclusion, and I'm, I'm going to get to it in a second, right? So what is, what, is the pos uh, pos pos what is the positive conclusion? So if you do not know what is good, and if you have to find this Archimedean point within yourself, so the first and obvious thing to do is, uh, I think, to try, to try to make an argument. Can you argue for goodness? Can you logically deduce, logically deduce uh, the universal standard of goodness? And this is a project that many philosophers have undertaken, uh, 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 maybe most famously Immanuel Kant with his categorical imperative. Kant's categorical imperative. But I'm not sure how, how much, how, how, you know, how deeply we need to go into this today. But basically, basically, the idea is that this project fails. It fails spectacularly. It appears to be impossible to deduce values. Uh -huh. And, and this, is, this, is basically, this is basically the root of Hume's is what problem. That you can, one cannot, one cannot, so it is impossible to derive normative statements from positive statements.
So it is impossible to derive values from facts. derive values from facts. And uh, basically, um, let's talk about this some more, right? So how can, how can we how can we argue for this? Well, one way to argue is that uh, It's obvious, it's obvious that there's no consensus. There is no consensus. There is no consensus. In the sense that nobody has been able to do this. Nobody has been able to do this. Now, conclusively, 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 or convincingly. So when I say this, uh, again, some of you may know that my allegiance lies with the skeptical school. And so as the skeptics, right, we, we the skeptics, right, we do not make positive conclusions because we believe that all positive conclusions are always perpetually open to further questioning, right? So among other things, it is clear to us as skeptics that you cannot prove a negative. So it is impossible to prove a negative. Um, so it's like if I were to try to convince you that there is that there is no pink unicorn right now in the room. How can how can I do this, right? So this is the I think the experiment thought experiment famous thought experiment of Russell's teapot. Russell's uh, teapot. If you want, look it up. Bertrand Russell says, uh, imagine that I tell you that there's a, a small teapot orbiting uh, around Jupiter. How can can you prove me wrong? Can you prove that there's no teapot orbiting <laughs> Jupiter. And, you know, how, how can you try to do this, right? You, you point your telescope to Jupiter and you say, look, I see no teapot. And you tell me, well, the teapot is too small for your telescope to see. And as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, this um, thought experiment was true back in Bertrand Russell's day. This thought experiment is still true. This thought experiment is still true. So even though, we can you know, measure the contents of atmospheres on distant exoplanets, still, still, in terms of the power of our satellites, uh, uh, you know, astronomers tell me, my astronomer friends tell me, that a small enough teapot is just completely invisible against the background of uh, <laughs> uh, 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 you know, planets of Jupiter, or, or I, I forget, was it Jupiter or Saturn? Right? We, we cannot really see that far, an object that small. Or, or at least it's quite possible that it's there, but we just cannot see it, right? So, so mm -hmm. I'm sorry, this was slightly too uh, long of an explanation, but the point, the point I, I hope is clear, again, it's like maybe, maybe in 10 years or 50 years or 100 years, somebody will be able to come, to come up with a geometrical or a mathematical proof as to <laughs> the, you know, the validity of uh, normative statements, right? Somebody maybe will be able to derive values from facts, but not now, not presently. Nobody has been able to do this, mm. as a matter of fact. Now, we also think that it's probably impossible because of the inherent limitations of human mind. But again, as good skeptics, as good skeptics, I think we should be open to the possibility that human mind maybe will change. Who knows? It's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to say. But I wouldn't count on it. I would not count on it, right, if I were you. Um, and at the same time, again, when I say this, I want you to take this seriously. I want you to take this seriously. The is odd problem is not like, like compare it. So compare, compare to uh, uh, Pythagorean theorem. Compare to Pythagorean theorem. So can we prove the Pythagorean theorem? So yes, we can prove the Pythagorean theorem barring sort of uh, uh, extreme skepticism of like the evil demon. So mm, barring extreme Cartesian. 
So there is, there is a broad universal consensus that the Pythagorean theorem has been proven, right? And it's not the same thing with the is-ought problem. And it's not the same thing with uh, uh, um, Kant's categorical imperative. So Kant's categorical imperative is not, so Kant's oops, categorical imperative fails as a proof, unlike something like Pythagorean theorem, about which there is universal consensus. Um, let me, you know, I should, I should be getting to the positive side of the equation, but let me, let me hang out for, with this uh, for, 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 for a while, right? Um, so, Kant, Descartes, hang on a second. Where was I going with this? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. David Hume. Hume also talks about the divine command theory. Hume on the divine command theory. So this is, in many ways, Euthyphro revisited. Euthyphro revisited. And the idea is that Hume says, okay, okay, okay. Imagine a statement. Imagine a statement that, uh, 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 um, okay, why should we do something simply because God, because God tells, okay, so uh, barring the question, do you know that there's a God? It's complicated, right? But still, you know, even if, even if you grant, even if you grant that there's a God, which, which is a big if, right? Should you grant that there's a God? Who knows? And what kind of God is there? Not all conceptions of God will allow you to derive values from the conception of God. Anyway, so again, why should, okay, so, so let's, let's, let's grant, let's grant the, I would say the highly contested, the highly controversial, the highly controversial premise that there's a God. Why should we do something simply because God tells us? If we say that uh, um, sort of we should do something that God commanded us because God commanded us, right? So follow. So God commands us. God commands us to follow God's command, right? So God commands us to follow God's command. Is this an additional command of God? If this is the answer, then the argument is circular. It says to do something because God tells us to, but the only reason it can give to obey God is because God tells us to, right? So uh, I'm not sure if I can explain this clearly, right? So, but sort of if God commands us to follow God's command, this is, this is a vicious circle, right? So it's like, unless you already have a value Again, it's like the same, the same problem of deriving an ought from an is. Unless you already have a value, uh, uh, a value or a goal or a principle, right? Value, unless you, unless you already have a value mm, that tells you, that tells you, oops, to follow. God's command. So unless you have it, then God's command is then uh, God's command is um, futile. It's useless. It's ineffective. It's void, right? It's void. So un unless unless you already believe that you should follow God's command, God cannot command you to obey Him. Because you know, so again, like a, 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 a like, if you follow a command because you, you were ordered to follow a command, then you could ask, okay, but why should you follow a command to follow a command? You see, we, we run into a vicious circle and an infinite regress. So again, so, uh, 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 so let me write this. Follow 
God's command to follow God's command to follow God's command, right? You understand, right? And, and this goes on forever and ever and ever. This is, this is, this is not an explanation. Again, this is, this is what philosophers call vicious circle, right? Um, or, or circular argument. But let's, you know, let's not stop here. Let's, let's, let's give another example. So let's talk about like Hume on, uh, Hume on, uh, 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 um, you know, emotions, emotions or of pleasure and pain on suffering. Yeah, human suffering. So you say, you say, you know. Uh, um, okay, so why should you do something simply because God tells us? So often people would say that uh, murder is wrong because it leads to suffering. Let's say killing is wrong. Killing is wrong because it leads to suffering. But why should we avoid doing something simply because it leads to suffering? Right? And it's like many people, again, when I was your age, this was, a, this was a revolutionary thought in my head. Like, I, I, this was not obvious to me at all, right? So I say, you should not kill a person because they will suffer. Yes, but this, is, this argument is only effective, this argument is only effective, only if you already believe that suffering is, is, is wrong, right? So this argument, killing is wrong because it leads to suffering, is also bad and circular. It's bad and circular. Why? Because unless you already have a value that suffering is wrong, that tells you that suffering is wrong, then this premise that killing is wrong because it leads to suffering is, is void. Then uh, So, so kind of this is this is this is the problem. This is the problem that it seems that values cannot be derived from anything other than values. So, so the con the conclusion the conclusion is that so Hume's conclusion, uh, or actually Hume's emotivism. Right. I'm gonna let's talk about Hume's emotivism. Values can only be derived from other values. Uh, uh, go back. Let's 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 hang out with this example for for a while. Let's imagine I'm a psychopath. Let's imagine I'm I'm a psychopath. And I think I think I think that suffering is good. I think suffering is good. Can you prove me wrong? Can you prove me wrong? Uh huh. And this is this is this is uh, a thought which, in many ways, go back to your economic. Well, it's like lies at the root of economic theory. So, compared to uh, economic notion of utility, the sort of this idea of that utility function is not derived. Utility function is given. Sort of utility function is given, not derived. So economics utility function is given, not derived. And it cannot be derived. And so what we, what we arrive at is this idea that um, reason, well, as Hume says, reason is and ought to be the slave of the passion. Reason is and ought to be the slave of the passion. So reason or rationality is a hired gun, is a gun for hire. It can, it, can, it can tell you how best to satisfy your desire, but it cannot tell you what your desire should be. It can tell you how to best satisfy 
desire, but not what you should desire. This, again, this idea of instrumental rationality. Instrumental rationality. Um, yeah. And so again, go back to this example, killing, killing. Let's, let's, ima again, let's imagine you're talking about frivolous killing. Let's imagine you're talking about frivolous killing. Is frivolous killing, you know, just for fun with no good reason, is it wrong? And again, Hume says, unless you already have a value that says that frivolous killing is wrong, you cannot really derive it from anywhere. And so I, we started with this premise, killing is wrong because it leads to suffering. Okay, let's talk about this. Is uh, uh, killing a man wrong? Most people would think, would say yes, uh, is killing a cockroach wrong? Killing a cockroach. Is this wrong? Right? And most people would probably say yes to the first. So most people would say yes. Is killing a cockroach wrong? Most people would say no, it's fine. Or, or at least, or at least like there, there, there's a difference. And then you can ask the question like, okay, but what is the, what is the, uh, like some kind of great difference in value between the life of a cockroach and the life of a man. Or, you know, it's like, um, well, anyway, I don't want to, it's, 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 it's a long and complicated discussion. And so what Hume is, is the, the kind of conclusion that Hume is going to reach is a negative conclusion. We don't know what is capital G good. This is unavailable to us. So the only thing that we are left with, with, so what we're left with, so what we, we are left only with small g good, namely what feels good, what naturally and automatically feels good. And so we, 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 we get to this assertion uh, uh, associated with Jeremy Bentham, this idea that of pleasure and pain, pleasure and pain. Right, uh, uh, um, the f uh, very famous uh, quote from Bentham, uh, if I can maybe find it quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters. Pleasure and pain. It is for them alone to point out what, what we ought to do as well as to determine what we should do, right? So this is, this is a quote from Hume. This is now going to be a, a quote from Bentham. Now, technically speaking, both Hume and Bentham, when they use the word ought here, this is, is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is bad logic because, uh, uh, because honestly, we don't know what's an ought. This is supposed to be a negative argument. Because we do not know what is capital G good, then th this, 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 is, this is why the use of ought is probably just rhetorical and just for fun on the part of uh, Hume and Bentham. So like, I don't think that Hume or Bentham can prove that we ought to satisfy our desires. So. The, the reason I have this in, in red is that neither Bentham nor Hume can probably prove that we should satisfy our desires. So uh, neither Bentham and Hume. This is, this is a minor point, I think, but still. Can't really prove that satisfying desires is capital G good. That satisfying, okay, let's that pleasure is capital G good. Uh, but they don't have to, they don't have to. Because again, in the absence of other motivators, in the absence of other motivators, we, we necessarily f uh, uh, fall onto, uh, fall have to fall back onto what, is na what seems natural desi desirable. So Hume's immotivism, this, uh, uh, this idea of pleasure. And um, pleasure as the small g good. And you see, I think this is an argument that makes a lot of sense. This is a naturalistic argument that 
it's, as far as we can tell, it seems, it appears that children, animals, and also humans in simpler societies, humans in simpler societies, or I should say communities, societies, communities, societies. Simpler and smaller societies. Like what, what people naturally do, and even like adults, but by nature, uh, um, How should I do this? Naturally seek pleasure and avoid pain. And avoid pain. Uh, right? And again, in the absence, in the absence of arguments to the contrary. We just, you know, there's, there's, there's no reason to not go along with this um, desire. So there's no reason to resist natural desires. Um, something like that. And, and notice that this is the argument which has an ancient pedigree. This argument goes back to, uh, you can find it in Epicureans, so in Epicurus, probably in Democritus as well. Let me write Democritus with a question mark, Epicurus. But also, also very importantly, the, the ancient skeptical tradition, so people like Sextus, Empiricus, and the, the Pyronian school, uh, with his emphasis on, on you know, skeptical mode of empiricism. Uh, so because, but also, very important, the Buddha, right? So the, the Buddhist doctrine of the Four Noble Truths, again, Buddha begins by asserting life is suffering, life is suffering. Notice, Buddha does not argue then, you know, that sort of life is suffering and suffering is something bad, we should avoid suffering. Notice, for Buddha, it is obvious, it is self-evident that we should avoid suffering. It's self-evident. that we should avoid suffering, right? And notice, notice. So yeah, so basically in, gen in general, I want to, I want to like, uh, uh, like, this whole lecture is basically in support of this argument. This, this, is, this is the centerpiece. This is, this is the reason I am giving this lecture because I want to promote uh, this philosophical point of view because I think at the end of the day, it's right or at least it's as close to right as you can get. Or, or it is the best argument in the, because we don't have any, any, any better arguments. It is the best argument which is left standing at the end of the day. Best argument left standing at the end of the day. Left standing at the end of the day. And um, I wanted to say something Well, yeah. Well, anyway, I wanted to say, but sort of notice, notice what happens if you ch notice what happens if you challenge. If you say no, if you say no, suffering is good. Then my question to you is: Do you have a good argument or a bad symptom? And I think this is a damn hard problem. I think this is a damn hard problem. Like in some sense, is it you talking? Is it you talking? Or is some kind of ideology that takes advantage of you speaking through you? Or is some ideology taking uh, advantage of you speaking through your mouth? Uh-huh, uh-huh, 
This is, I think, again, for, for me, this is what animates my philosophical pursuit. Um, I, yeah, I, hope, I hope I'm making myself clear, and I hope that you know, I'm making the argument clear enough. So we don't have a lot of time, but let me, let me, let me try to, like, what are the conclusions? And the, con the conclusion is very simple. So it appears that we cannot find anything which we, we can, which we can call value with a capital V or good with a capital G. So uh, can't find capital G good or capital V values, etc. So what we are left with is again this deflation, deflationary, deflation, deflation of uh, values. Right? So again, you see. Uh, uh, say hi to Nietzsche again. This transvaluation of values. Once we realize that capital V values are unavailable to us, and we make our own values, these values are not real values with a capital V. They are small V values. They are other, other, other values. So de de deflation of values. So say hi to Nietzsche. Uh, like we, we we can only have again like small V values. We can only we are left with small v values. And so there's, there's, like, there's no meaning of life. There's no meaning to life apart from some form of pleasure. Maybe, maybe you can talk about the distinction between higher, higher and lower pleasures, like intellectual pleasures, pleasures of philosophy, David Hume, you know, famously talks about how, uh, you know, philosophy actually, the, the, like the the, the um, justification for doing philosophy is because it is pleasant, uniquely pleasant, and gives us unique kind of pleasure, and this is, uh, 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 you know, this is this is the justification. Even even if you allow for things like such as, such as higher, higher pleasure, so and there is no such thing as justice, no. No meaning to the word justice. Well, okay, no meaning to the word goodness apart from interest. And therefore, no meaning to the word justice. Again, this phrase, say hi to Hobbes, right? This quote that, you know, whatsoever is the object of any man's appetite or desire is that which he, for his part, calls good, and of his hate and aversion, evil, there being nothing simply and absolutely so. It's that, it's that time of the lecture. To give you the quote, mm. the whatsoever quote, right? Um, and there's no such thing as justice apart from common interest. And therefore, again, this is this is the new justification or a different justification, justification of the Enlightenment project of the Enlightenment. Again, it, it, appears, it appears that human nature is, uh, broadly speaking, pro-social. So apparently, humans are broadly pro-social. Broadly, let's say generally, pro-social. I, I, think, I think it's a realistic assumption, but you have to understand it's a strong assumption. So it's a strong claim. Is it controversial? Eh. I don't think it's really controversial, but you know, if you want to, if you want to attack the theory, this is this is this is where you should attack the theory. Okay, uh, human beings are generally pro-social, so again, justice just is common interest, and the, the the idea is that because humans have a particular nature, we there is a particular common interest. So, uh, common human nature, common interest. And the point of the social contract is simply to create a society which facilitates our pursuit of a pleasant or happy life together. Sort of. And like we we gotta do it together because right now it appears it appears apparently we live in a society which is not well ordered. Our society. It's written with conflict. It's not well ordered. It's written with conflict. 
And again, especially, especially if you think of the 7 billion people on planet Earth, most people don't lead, lead lives which are good in any shape, matter, or form. We'll talk about this more when we get to Marx, I guess. Uh, uh, and, and so the project of enlightenment, a project of enlightenment, uh, is the idea of how can we, again, rationally restructure. So again, so how, how can we go from conflict to consensus? So right now, this is conflict. How can you go from conflict to consensus? So through the process of enlightenment, how can you ra rationally restructure society so as to bring in line the interests of the individuals and the interests of the whole? to harmonize the individual and the social. Okay, well anyway, kind of fail with this formatting stuff, but you, you can, I hope you can see what I'm driving at. And, um, Again, you could ask this claim, you know, like, like to, to, what, to what extent, to what extent uh, is this really a realistic project? Is this pr realistic project? And I want to say just look at science. So science is, first of all, it is very much based on consensus in the sense that science is, a, is an intrinsically cooperative enterprise. Science is intrinsically cooperative. Science is impossible unless people cooperate in good faith. And secondly, science is progressive. In the sense that uh, it, it allows us to improve our lives, right? So improvement, right? And so, like, again, the idea is that we can, we can benefit from cooperation much more than much more than from uh, conflict. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you, you, you know, some of you may see this coming, some of you may see this coming. This is the argument, this is the argument. And again, broadly speaking, we're gonna talk about this uh, more when we get to Karl Marx, because I think, I think this is the core of Marx's communist project. Uh, but at the end of the day, of course, you got to ask yourself, if you are good philosophers, what I have given, given you, is it a good argument or is it a bad symptom? Ah, <laughs> or a bad symptom. So uh, should I do <laughs> what I did last time? Why not? So like, broadly <laughs> speaking, remember? So I finished, I finished the last... Uh, uh, class by talking about socialism or barbarism with, with exclamation marks and then I went back and I said with a question mark right <laughs> let's 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 do let's do the same thing for our lecture today as well um, but that's the basic idea and you see again why, why the heck am I talking about this because this is basically like this is, this is the, the, like the ultimate upshot of the course, sort of philosophy of science. So ISAF philosophy of science 20 gives you this idea that science is the pinnacle of human achievement. That science, science is the most important thing that human beings do and is potentially the salvation of humanity. Science is the most important uh, uh, thing that people do. And science 
offers us the best hope of salvation. The best, if not the only. For, so, okay, salvation maybe is a loaded term, so let's say, for a brighter future, for a better tomorrow. <laughs> Self-help credentials of the course, right? Um, and, and that's the argument. And that's the argument. Again, remember, I said at the beginning of the course, we're moving from protons to presidents and from electrons to elections. So we move from this uh, 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 um, hypothetical Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago up to the pinnacle of human achievement, which is uh, philosophy of science and everybody who does philosophy of science in 2020, which hopefully includes you and me. And on this self-congratulatory note, <laughs> is it a good argument? Is it a good argument or is it a bad symptom? Stimulate. Food for thought. Food for thought. On this congratulatory but slightly, uh, 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 you know, self-deprecating note, let me um, finish the lecture. I hope this was fun. This was definitely fun for me. Uh, it was, you know, I was going into unfamiliar territory. This is a bit of an improvisation lecture. I was not sure how, it, how it's going to end up, but I'm more or less satisfied with the results. Um, so I hope this was fun. Thank you very much for joining me uh, uh, um, today. For Thank you. you know, I appreciate your company. Mm -mm. I hope you found this stimulating, food for thought. Um, and if you have any questions, I would be more than happy uh, um, to talk to you uh, in the seminars. And, but, but otherwise, I will see you next time. I will see you sort of on the next installment of our <laughs> Saturday Night Live program. And uh, until, then, until then, colleagues, until then, please, take care. Take care. And probably I should finish here. <laughs>